Okay. Well, hey, you're here today. That's a good thing. Excited. Before we get into this sermon series, I want to share a few things with you and uh, do better than they did last night. They let me feel very disappointed because uh, they kind of indicated to me that obviously they don't remember my preaching, so I'm not doing a good job. But do you remember a few weeks ago we said, what happens within the first seven minutes that a visitor pulls into your parking lot? Thank you, Marcy. Somebody listened. What's that again? So if you didn't hear it, she said, a visitor decides within the first seven minutes whether or not they're going to come back to your church. That's what they have found. That's before I ever come up here to preach. It's before they ever hear the amazing worship, which, by the way, wasn't the worship great this morning? Yes, praise God. So, um, so they've already decided before any of that, before you're friendly and they have snacks, and therefore it's so important that the moment they go to their car that they have a good experience. One of the ways that you can help that happen is we're looking for people to sign up to be on the greeting team. Very easy. You're already coming to church. You only come 15 minutes earlier and be in the greeting team. So we're looking for people to sign up. In a couple weeks, we're going to have a little meeting, make a few tweaks so we can increase our effectiveness because we have a lot of visitors that have been coming here, but we want to make sure that we can follow up with them and get them connected. And so uh, maybe you've tried it before and it's time to get back on the, the team. Or maybe you're somebody who's never tried it before and you're interested. So anyways, if you could go ahead and pass that around, that'd be wonderful. And one more thing before we go there is uh, Jamie Daniel, why don't you go ahead and stand up? They got married yesterday. Let's all give him a, yeah, isn't that exciting? Congratulate them. So i um, very proud of these guys because they made the choice to honor God and to do the right thing. Um, and a lot of people would have uh, maybe found another reason to wait to put it off, but they said, you know, we want to honor God. And they got married yesterday, so that's awesome. Praise God. So uh, God's doing good things. Now let's, uh, let's pray and get our head into the right space for the message. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, I pray that our hearts would be good soil to receive what you have. Father, I would pray for everybody here that somebody would get a word that would resonate with them, that would speak to them, that would help them grow in their faith. Father, I realize that not all of this applies to everybody, but I believe that there'll be something that will apply to everybody. And I pray that we would leave here not just thinking differently, but as I always pray, living differently for your glory. Father, we want to be a church that's spirit-filled and spirit-led. And I would ask that you remove any hindrance that's keeping that from happening. So, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, we've been going through uh, the building a healthy community. Uh, we want to be healthy individuals. We want to be a healthy church community because if we are, we'll bear fruit. Now, before I get into that, I've often thought I've wrestled with this through the years. And, you know, my 20 years of ministry, you know, maybe if we had a little bit shorter messages, maybe you know, a little more engaging, a little more entertaining and not so boring, maybe that would be the key to church growth. Um, but studying old-time preachers, And what I think we're seeing today as pastors is they say that shallow preaching produces shallow Christians. Uh, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so what I think maybe we're happening is we talk about, you know, right now a lot of people are leaving the Christian faith in America, and as pastors we wonder, maybe they never had a solid foundation. And so given the idea of, yeah, maybe we should shorten it up and just make it a little more entertaining, or do we want Christians who have a strong foundation? And I would say we want Christians with a strong foundation, Amen. And, uh, and I know you guys want to grow, right? Yes. Okay. I know you'll sit there and watch the Vikings for three hours only to be disappointed. So staying here for an hour and 15 minutes, uh, you can handle that. So, so here we are. Um, we've been going through this. What does a healthy church community look like? Well, the first thing we discuss is how important culture is. And you guys determine the culture, not me. We all contend for the culture. We talked about this thing of act. It's what we articulate, what we celebrate, and ultimately what we tolerate. Second characteristic of a healthy church community is healthy churches are on mission. Amen? God has given us a mission, and that means that we're outward focused. And it was great last Sunday. Who was there last Sunday in Morgan Park? So we had 200 people sign up. That's not even including our people that showed up. So we guessed it was around maybe 350 people came there, and we want to reach out to Morgan Park. And so we want to be mission focused. The third characteristic is this. John wanted to know how the church was doing. He wanted to know if they were healthy or not healthy. And the report that he got that told them they were doing well was God's truth was at the center of their lives. It is an impossibility to say I'm a healthy Christian and we are a healthy church if we were rejected or if we push God's word aside. Amen? So we want to make sure that we are a church and a people that have God's truth guiding everything that we do. Another one we've talked about a lot, and I don't know what to say with this one to to shake us up, 
But if we are a healthy church community, then we are going to live and operate as a family. And I still think that there's this mindset that, you know, here's my church family, and then, then there's my regular family. But you know that God doesn't want any difference? He wants us to operate like we are really family. And so we have to really work hard at trying to break down those walls and really connect like that. We discussed in the fifth week that healthy churches have good administration and good systems. We looked at the trellis and the vine analogy and this idea that if we want to do well, then we have to have systems so that people don't slip through the cracks. And that administration, that gift is from God. The sixth week, we talked about healthy communication. It's inevitable in your marriage, in life, at work, in church, we are going to have issues, amen? Um, But I think the key to overcoming it and being healthy is the ability to communicate well. And so we talked about how important that is. And I'm here to tell you that um, a lot of people, they don't have a healthy communication. In fact, it's the opposite, where a situation may pop up in their life and it's not a big deal, and healthy communication could cause them to move on without any real problems. Their bad communication actually caused it to make it worse. And then last week, we talked about how important it is to be emotionally healthy. That God has given us a soul, and our soul is where our emotions are, and he wants to sanctify body, soul, and spirit. And so we want to be emotionally healthy, and right now we talked about a lot of people who are struggling emotionally. Depression, anxiety, anger, bitterness, whatever it is, they have all these issues, and God wants to change that. I hope you guys had a chance to go home and take the... Did anybody do the inventory test last week? Okay, Cindy, and then one other. So good on you. So this week, small group leaders, I'm charging you with the fact that you're going to go back with your teams and in your small group, go through this and talk about emotional health. So here we are this week, and we're supposed to talk about love. And, uh, but we're not going to. Uh, I'm going to give that to Jesse to talk about love and uh, the reason why he's doing a study on this. And we have a class that's on love. And so I thought if he's already going to do that in a few weeks, he's going to fill in for me for my anniversary weekend. And so we're going to give that to Jesse. And what I'm going to talk about this week instead is that healthy church communities must be spirit-filled and spirit-led. But here's the thing. The topic of the Holy Spirit creates a lot of confusion for people. So I've broken it down into three points. The first two points are why being spirit-led and spirit-filled is necessary. And then the third point is the evidence that we, or you individually, are spirit-led and spirit-filled. And so that's what we're going to look at today, how important that is. If we want to be as healthy as can be, the key then is letting God's Spirit fill us and lead us in everything that we do. So here's the first point. Here's the first reason why we have to be spirit-filled, because if you're not spirit-filled and spirit-led, then you're not saved. And I don't know about you, but that's a big deal. Anybody want to go to heaven? I do. And it makes it very clear that you can do a lot of things in God's name. Matthew 7 talks about a group of people had served God, and they did all these things in the name of Jesus. And then on that day, when they're excited to go into heaven at the end of their life, and they get before Jesus, and he says what to them? Depart from me, I never knew you. Could you imagine hearing that? oh my, that would just be crushing. And yet there's a group of people there that that's exactly what they, and I've always read that, and I wondered, how is it that these people didn't know? How did these people who serve God in the name of Jesus didn't get right with God? And my take on that is, and here's where I'm saying, I don't want that to be me, and I don't want it to be you. I don't want to hear those words, and I'm sure you're the same way. What I want to hear on that day is, good job, faithful servant. So how do we know? How do we know we're not being deceived? So here's some verses that would clarify the need to be spirit-filled to be saved. And the first one is the interaction that Jesus had with Nicodemus. He says to him, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to be born again? And Nicodemus actually asked him that. He said, hey, can a man go back and enter his mom's womb again? Which is kind of a weird thing to say, like, how do you go back and enter your mother's womb? But he says that. And here's what Jesus says. Unless somebody is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is born of flesh is flesh, and that is born of spirit is spirit. So he's beginning to really establish this idea of being born again of God's spirit. 
We'll, we'll look at a few more verses that will clarify this point. First Peter, it says this, that we've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. And then later on in 1 John, we'll find that that incorruptible seed that we've been born again is God's spirit in our lives. If you want to know that you're saved, if you want to guarantee that you're going to heaven, well, Ephesians makes it very clear that that's the guarantee you have. It says this right here. In Jesus, you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, you trusted in Jesus, you believed, and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is your guarantee. The guarantee that you're going to heaven, according to Paul, is that you have the Holy Spirit. That's your seal. That's your redemption. And so that's how you can know for sure there. It says this in Romans 8. It says, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. What's interesting there is Paul's teaching this. He said, if, and he's writing to Christians. So he's saying, if the spirit of God dwells in you, he says, if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he does not belong to God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. So if you're saved, if you are a child of God, you will have God's Spirit. And if you don't have God's Spirit, you're not saved. And I think there's a lot of misconception. I think there's this idea that every human being that's ever been born on the face of the earth is born with God's Spirit, but that's not true. We are all created by God. Every single human being has been created by God. But there's a difference between God's children and the children of the world, and we'll look at that later on. Here's the second reason why it's so important that we are spirit-filled and spirit-led. It's the only way we can be fully effective and fully fruitful. It is the only way that we can really serve God on mission in our daily lives. It's the only way that you can be the best parent you want to be, the best husband, father, mother, daughter, wife, whatever it is, whatever you're doing in the name of God, the best way to be fruitful is with God's Spirit. And so we want to make sure in Exodus 33, here's what God said to Moses. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us out of Egypt, out of bondage. So why did Moses say that? He said, don't even send us out. God, if your spirit doesn't go with us, then leave us right here. There's two reasons why he said that. The first reason is this, and this is the most important, is they love God and they want to be in God's presence. That's it. See, what makes heaven so great is not the absence of sin. It's not the absence of suffering. It's not the great many things, the glorious things that we will experience. Yes, that'll be there. But what makes heaven so great is the presence of God. And what Moses says here is he says, I would rather stay in Egypt I'd rather be a slave who's being mistreated and beaten and all these horrible things happening to me. I'd rather stay there than go anywhere where God's presence is not. That's a powerful statement. Just think about that for a second. He'd rather be a slave. And I think we have to take that posture in our lives. We have to take that posture in our churches, in our small groups, in our services. We need God's presence in everything that we do. And I, and I wonder how much we do in our own strength, you know? How many times we launch out with something that might be good, but have we really sought after God? Have we really prayed and said, God, we need your presence with us now? And everything. How many times do we launch out, like I said, without really taking the attitude and the posture that Moses had? And that's why we really encourage you in every aspect, pray. Seek God. We're talking about doing another fast in January for a week. We did it last year, and I think that would be a good thing. And here's the other reason why Moses does it. One, he wants to be with God. He loves God. But two, he realizes the vanity of working in your own strength. And I'll tell you what, if I'm being honest with you guys today, I think I've sadly done a lot of things on my own strength. I get enthusiastic. I get excited. I see the value in it. I can even show you scripture that would justify my action, and then I run out ahead. And we have to learn to be a people that say, God, we need your presence in everything that we do. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time. It's all vanity. In John 15, it says this. Jesus made it very clear that if you abide in me and I in you, 
A branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. He abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. If you are connected to Jesus in the presence of God, you will bear fruit. And then he goes on to say this, for without me you can do what? Nothing. 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 And do we really believe that also? That I could work hard and I can do all these things, but without God, without my connection to Jesus, nothing I can do will be fruitful. And so we really want to take that on and we want to really be mindful of that. In Psalms, it says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Unless God is with us, blessed in our services, our Bible studies, our outreaches, whatever it might be, if God is not behind it, then we're wasting our time. And so we have to be people that would seek God and presume nothing. Trying to serve God well, to lead your family well, to honor God, to bear fruit, it's impossible without God's presence, God's spirit. And the reason why is God's spirit does a few things. One, it guides us. God's spirit empowers us. And the other thing that God's spirit does that makes us fruitful is he gives us gifts. God gives us gifts, which are tools to use. Tools to accomplish the work that he's called us to do. The mission that we're on. When God gives you a tool, by the way, these tools, these gifts will help you grow in holiness, godliness, love, etc. And using the right tool makes work a lot easier, more effective. It would be utterly foolish to reject a tool that God has given us. i got a short video for you. Um, it's like an hour-long video, and it shows all these tools that make life easier. And then there's some tools out there that aren't, but they're just amazing. So go ahead and play that real quick. Isn't that, uh, I love, by the way, the last one's satisfying, isn't it? Watching that pain come off there. Having the right tool makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Now, how many of you, I know a number of you guys have done different things. You were a carpenter. Um, obviously, we know that you do a lot of work. Um, having the right tools will change your work, not only make you more effective and fruitful, but you just do a better job. See, and God has given us gifts, and these gifts are tools to help us do this work. Have you ever used the wrong tool? I remember years ago, I was, uh, my wife wanted me to put up a finishing nail to hang something, you know, the tiny little nails, and I, I couldn't find my hammer, but I found this vice grip that was kind of big and heavy. I'm like, I'll just use this. It's just a finishing nail. Has anybody ever done something like this? 
trying to pound it, and then I bent the nail and smashed my finger. It was, and my wife just looked at me the whole time like, you're an idiot, you know. Um, she was right. But isn't the same vanity when we try to serve God well and be fruitful and we're not using the tools he's given us? So here's the thing. I understand that spiritual gifts scare a lot of people, can feel weird. They, feel, uh, they, they fear abuse. And I've seen things done in the name of spiritual gifts that is quite honestly unbiblical and weird. And yes, misuse can cause problems, but not using God's gifts can be as destructive, if not more so, than misusing them. It would be very foolish to reject God's tools. He's given to us. And these gifts are created to help us become a healthier community, a healthier church, and healthier ministries. Romans 12, it talks about, it says us, it says, all of us members together make one body, but all members not have the same function. Did you hear that? We don't have the same function. We all have a different function, and that's why it's so fundamentally important that you get plugged into community, that you use your gifts, because we have to come together, and if we all come together consistently and using our gifts, that's when we get the healthiest. And it goes on that we all have different gifts, and this is, my, by the way, one more thing, and I want to just throw this out there. Typically, the gift that we have, we get passionate for, and it makes us very hard to understand or embrace other people's gifts. It's really important that you understand that it's good that you have your gift, but everybody's gift is different, and they're going to operate different in the body of Christ than you do. And so here's what he said. We have different gifts according to the grace that's given to us. Let us use them. And he lists prophecy, gifted in ministry, teaching, exhortation, and giving, and leadership and mercy. And then in Corinthians it says this, there's a diversity of gifts, a diversity of ministries, and a diversity of activities. I love that he lists that way. He says gifts, ministries, and activities, because sometimes there are activities that maybe on the surface don't look very spiritual. Doing an outreach in Morgan Park, I could hear some people, and I'll tell you what, when I was a new Christian, I would have been critical of it. You know, we just need to be at church and have a Bible study. We don't need to do this stuff, and why do you have a bouncy house? That's stupid. That would have been me. Um, that's an activity, and God is in activities if we are being spirit-led. And those activities can help us reach people. Then he goes on to say this, that God's working in all three of these, and that the Spirit of God gives to each one according to his will and the profit of others. The spiritual gift that you have, it's not for you. It's for another person. It's for the body of Christ. So when you don't use your gifts or you stay home and you're not in fellowship, and you're not connected in community, that gift is going dormant. It's not doing God any good because the gift was given to you for other people. Y'all track with me on this? And here's the gifts that he lists. He says there's a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. And it says God distributes according to his will for you. Now, I want to clarify something there, because I think there's confusion between talents and gifts, and they are separate. You can have a lot of talents. You can be talented at music. You can be a good athlete. Maybe you're great at making crafts. I know that, uh, Jill, you're good at making cards. You love making cards. We use them a lot to send to people. And so you can have a lot of talents that you can parlay into ministry, ways to connect, to reach people, but a talent is not a spiritual gift. The spiritual gifts are specifically listed in Scripture. So if it's not listed there, then maybe it's a talent, but spiritual gifts are very clear what those are. And so here's some practical application for you. And if you're a small group leader, if you're in a small group, please pay attention to what I'm about to say. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are and are you using them? I would encourage in the next couple of weeks in your small groups, be prepared to have that conversation. What's your spiritual gifts? We're encouraging our leaders to have a spiritual gift inventory test. I think he's going to try to find some that are going to be decent to share. You take the test, it can give you an idea of what your gifting is. Then we can help you get plugged in and develop it and use it. That's a huge one right there. So being spirit-led and filled is effective for ministry. It's necessary for salvation. But here's the real question. This is the final part. How do you know then that you're spirit-filled and spirit-led? Because that's really important. How do we really know? Uh, I want to make sure to get this right. Well, I think it's important to realize that if you want to be spirit-led and filled, according to Galatians, it says if we live in the spirit, 
Let us walk in the Spirit. And what that tells me is that we have a choice. You have to choose to cooperate with God, to submit to Him, to seek Him, to feed your spirit. And then some would say that this evidence that your spirit letter filled is your feelings. And they would quote Romans 8, but they would take it out of context. We used to teach this at Teen Challenge, but sadly we didn't teach the whole verse and it created confusion. Here's what Romans 8 would say. It says, you do not receive a spirit of bondage to fear, but a spirit of adoption as we cry out, Abba, Father. And God's spirit bears one with us, our spirit, that we're children of God. So how some people have interpreted that without looking at the context is that I, I feel saved, I feel fine, so God must be telling me that I am fine. But that's not what he said. Here's what he says in the entire chapter. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of God, he is not his. For as many that are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So he's saying the evidence, God's spirit, bearing witness with your spirit, is that you're spirit-led. So what does it mean to be spirit-led? Well, your life won't be perfect once you're a Christian, not at all. But your life will be different, and by the grace of God, you will change. And here it is, right here. As many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And Galatians says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not going to do what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what it says means you're not going to habitually sin in these things, that God's going to come into your life and he will transform you and he will change you. And that's the evidence that I must have the Spirit of God in my life. I'm not perfect, but thank God I'm not the man or woman that I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever it is. That's the evidence of Spirit working in your life. Now some would say there, what does that mean when it says if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law? Some would read that and say, oh, if I'm a Christian, then the law just doesn't apply to me. But what that really means is this. What he's getting at there is if you're spirit-led, you're not going to be breaking God's law. You're not going to be cheating on your wife. You're not going to be lying all the time. You're not going to be getting drunk and high and all these sort of things because you're led by the Spirit. And if you're led by the Spirit, you're not breaking God's law. It's this idea that if you're driving down the road and you're doing the right thing, then you're not a lawbreaker and you don't have to worry about this guy hiding. And, uh, and I remember when I used to work at the prison in the cities years ago, and I wasn't a Christian, just so you know, but I would always do terrible time management, and then I'd have to be from Cloquet down to Stillwater for my shift, and I probably needed two and a half hours, but I gave myself like two hours, but I'd make up with it with my heavy foot. But I knew where all the cops would hide. But the whole time, I was living in fear, driving down there, going extra fast, trying to get to work on time. Has anybody ever done that? Y'all raise your hands. You know you have. Hopefully not recently, but... Uh, um, But what he's saying is that if you're doing the right thing, then you don't have to be afraid of the cop. And if you're doing the right thing, not breaking God's law, then God's law has no power over you. But the moment you break the law, then the law has power over you. That's what he's saying. And that's what Romans 13 says to us also. Life transformation is the biggest and best evidence of God's spirit in your life. And if our lives are being transformed, the result is our church community will begin much healthier. Your lives will get changed. New people coming in their lives will get changed. And then other people outside of our church will see lives being transformed. I'm here to tell you that's going to be an amazing thing. That's a win-win for everybody. It's a win for our evangelism, and it's a win for us as we get to come to a church that's healthier. Here's some other evidence of that. 2 Timothy says people have a form of godliness but deny its power. Some people have kind of taken that out of context to mean um, they want to pursue, you know, supernatural or justify certain gifts or downplay the true evidence of God. But if you read the context, he's clear. Here's what he says in the last days. By the way, anybody feel like we're living in the last days? And here's what he says. In the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemy, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers, headstrong, haughty, that's prideful. Love pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. The lack of power is evidenced by sin. It's evidenced by your old nature still prevalent in your life. That's what he's saying. And then we see this in 1 John, where he makes this difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. And he goes on to say in 1 John this, he said, Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness or right living is righteous just as God is righteous. He who practices sin is of the devil, 
The devil sinned from the beginning. Whoever's been born of God does not practice sin because God's seed remains in him. Remember early on we talked about God's seed? Referring to God's spirit. Been born again. And it goes on to this, that the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Who does not practice righteousness is not of God, neither does he who does not love his brother. God makes a difference in the lives of his people. He really does. And we see this promise in Ezekiel. And here's what he said, I will gather you out from the world. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness, your sins, your idols. I'll give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you. Going back to what we talked about at the beginning. He said, I'll take out your heart of stone, that hard heart, that prideful heart, that resists God, that doesn't want truth, that wants to do things our own way. He's like, I'm going to take out that heart, and I'm going to give you a tender heart. He said, I will put my spirit within you. Now listen to this. I will put my spirit within you, and the result is you will keep my words and my judgments, and you will do them. That word you will is a definitive statement, and it means expressing inevitable events, not an option, eventual outcome. We see sanctification, God's spirit together. Another evidence for us and individually and as a church that we are spirit-led and filled is that we're produced fruits of the spirit. And I tell you what, this is, the, this is so beautiful. When people and churches just overflow with the fruits of the Spirit. And here's what they are. In Ephesians 5 and Galatians, they say goodness, kindness, truth, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so what we are is we are a sum of all of our individual parts or all of our individual people. So as you bear fruit, then the church will bear fruit and we'll become healthier together if we bear fruit of the Spirit. And that's going to make us healthy. And that's a church I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a church that has love, joy, peace, kindness. Anybody want to be a part of that? When we come here, that's what I need. I need to laugh, and I need to feel loved by you guys, and I want to feel safe here. Um, I want you to have grace for me when I have an off day or, or my, still, my human nature still shows its ugly head. And here are the definitions of those things. If you're not sure what they are in your life, what it should look like, well, the definition of peace is this. State of tranquility or quiet, freedom from troubling, depressing, oppressive thoughts, emotions, or anxiety. He's discussing emotional health we talked about last week. It means harmony in your personal relationships, the end of hostility. Those that are walking the Spirit, man, you'll see that things get healed and reconciled. They're a peacemaker. There'll be unity. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, and that means control of your impulses, emotions, or desires. That means we, even when we're having a bad day and we want to maybe say something to somebody or being rude and we want to fire back a comment or the guy in front of us is driving so and you want to irritated, you can have self-control. It means long-suffering, and here's what that means. It means patiently enduring lasting offense or hardship. Patience, it really means putting up with each other. Long-suffering doesn't mean that everything's great. In fact, the opposite means that we have the ability when things aren't going so well or somebody's getting underneath your skin or getting on your nerves that you can still suffer long with that person in community. Kindness, it means sympathetic, helpful, forbearing nature, gentle. It's characterized by sympathy, perspective-taking. Somebody who has got kindness, they can put themselves in other people's shoes. That's what it means. It means kindness in your speech and in your actions. Goodness. State of being good, we produce good things. There's faithfulness. It means this, full of faith, steadfast in affection, allegiance, loyal, firm, and adheres to a promise. Observation of duty, trustworthy. You know what it means? It means you're a reliable person. You say what you're going to do. You do what you're going to say. People can rely on you. You're consistent. You're conscientious. You're mindful. You're true to the facts. There's gentleness. It means being gentle, free from being harsh, free from being stern, violence. Now, this is key. Gentle in action, gentle in speech, and gentle in how you handle relationships and situations. You can go into situations, and you're going to be gentle in how you handle that. And then there's righteousness. Basically, what that means, living according to God's divine or moral law in right relationship with God. It also means a sense of moral outrage when we see God's laws are violated. It means to live godly simply. Truth. 
means that God's truth will be the center of your life. You cannot claim to be a follower of God and yet reject his truth because they go hand in hand. Love. Now listen to this. Strong affection arising out of kinship or personal ties. This is for one another, not your family, for the church family. Affection that's based on admiration, benevolence, common interest, a warm attachment, and enthusiasm. It means that we have an enthusiasm to be together, to see each other. When you walk in the door, I get excited to see you. And when you're not here, I miss you. And we should feel that way to one another, right? Amen. And enthusiasm. It's like, yes. I saw you guys come back from trip today. I felt bad that you weren't still out there, but I'm also happy that you guys were here today. I was like, yes, they're back. Okay? They haven't quit the church yet. Praise God. Just kidding. <laughs> it says joy. There's a lot of Christians out there that have no joy. You know, there's some Christians, and I used to be this way, it's like, a good Christian just goes along, and you're just tough down, you're a good soldier, and it's almost like you have to be miserable for Jesus, but joy is a fruit of the Spirit. We should have joy in our lives, in our churches. There's a lot of things that we could talk about, generosity, compassion, empathy, holiness, but the point is, the fruit of the spirits of goodness, righteous love, joy, peace, kindness, all these sort of things... They should saturate our lives individually and our church and our gatherings. Even when you're having coffee with another believer, love, joy, peace, kindness should be there. You're on social media. You know what? Those fruits of spirit should be evident when you're on social media. Amen? There's never a time that we as a Christian shouldn't be bearing these fruits. We should exude it. So the question for you and I is this is, are our lives filled with fruits of the Spirit? And if they are, could they be more so? If I'm loving, could I be more loving? Could I be more patient? And that's what we want to strive for. Another thing that we'll find out is this. God's Spirit is flexible. We see that in the book of James, which means that plays out many forms in our church service, in our board meetings, in our mission. Being Spirit-led makes, it means we make no assumptions and it means that we do life in ministry with an open hand that God gives and God takes away because we're letting God's Spirit guide us. And I found a point here as we wrap this up is that church communities and Christians that compromise truth, that fight with each other all the time, that are unloving, that are divided, they're unkind, they're impatient, they're judgmental, uh, unholy, the things that we see sometimes in churches out there, things that cause the world to question the sincerity of our faith. This is not God's spirit leading them. A church that's filled and looks just like the world with no transformation, sin justified, how could these be spirit-filled, spirit-led God churches? Because if we are, we saw the evidence of it will be the opposite. I think if churches would be more mindful of being spirit-filled and led, a lot of the issues that plague churches today and Christians will begin to go away. And we would see us become more of a light to the world. I will finish with this here and say, God will make a difference in your life. And I know I've shared this before, but Paul Washer, one time he said this, and it really resonated with me. He said, if I was doing a teaching or something, and I was doing a conference, and one of the brothers there, and he showed up late, and, and oh, hey, brother, you're late. What happened? He said, Paul, you're not going to believe it. On the way to church, I was coming here, and the tire went flat on my car. So I got out to change the tire, and while I'm changing, I wasn't paying attention. And all of a sudden, here comes a Mack truck. I stood up and got hit by a Mack truck at 65 miles an hour. It's not you driving it, is it? Okay. He's a truck driver, so, you know, in this case, he's the guy not paying attention. Just kidding. And he said, Paul, I got hit by a Mack truck at 65 miles an hour, so that's why I'm late. Paul would say, I'd either say you're a liar or you're crazy, because it is impossible to have an encounter with a Mack truck at 65 miles an hour and not be changed. And then Paul said this, what's greater, a Mack truck or God? God is. And when you have an encounter with God, you will be different. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we want to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Whatever that looks like, Father, and whatever might be holding that back, if we're not operating in all the gifts, if we're not operating in all the fruit of the Spirit, Father, show us. Pour out your Spirit on us. Help us to embrace that. Help us to walk fully in that for your glory. We want to serve you well. We want to be a light to others. And Father, we can't do without you like it says in John. Without you, we can do nothing. But Father, with you, we are more than able. And so Father, we thank you. We love you. 
Father, I would pray for our small groups as we talk about emotional health and spiritual gifts, that a lot of fruit would come from those conversations, a lot of practical application as we begin to live out our faith in a more real way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.